There's a lot of pain in our country. There's a lot of grief at many levels. But I want us to hear the words of Isaiah 40 this morning. And I'm going to read the entire chapter. If you have your Bibles, feel free to open them to Isaiah 40. Because it was this morning, meeting with the Lord, as so often happens, when the Lord gave me the answer that I needed to have. In somewhat of the hopelessness that I was feeling, the grief that I was feeling, the lament I was feeling, this passage doesn't cause me to stop grieving. It doesn't cause me to stop lamenting. But it gives me hope and it gives me comfort that I've needed this week. This, this of course, is the passage that I've been sharing from verses 3 through 5 over and over and over again. This grand excavation project that we're on. To move mountains, to lower the mountains, to raise the valleys, to make the crooked places straight and the rough places plain, so that a highway can be created for God to Mount Zion, so that people can jump on this highway for God. I absolutely believe that as the mountains have fallen during this COVID crisis, that those are the mountains falling of God's movement, of God's work. Perhaps we weren't excavating quickly enough. I don't know what it was. But whatever is happening in this time, God is accelerating our movement towards Mount Zion. I believe that. But we're still called to join, as Donway said last week. It's up to us whether we, we join that project or not. And so I've been focusing really on the work of that project, but I've missed the comfort of this passage. And it's only this week in reading this passage again that I remembered that the end of chapter 40 is such a comforting end of chapter 40. And we'll get there in a moment. I'm going to read this passage and I have a few thoughts periodically as we move throughout the passage. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Imagine if you're an Israelite, a Jew in exile, and you hear this, these words of comfort coming from God who has just punished you for 70 years, saying, your hard service has been completed. Your sin has been paid for. I want to comfort you. I want to comfort you. Comfort, 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 says the Lord. We have been an unfaithful people in so many ways. Yes, us. And yet the Lord says to us this morning, comfort. Comfort, my child. Hang out in my comfort. Hang out this morning in my compassion and care. I don't have a lot of easy answers this morning, but I do want to hang out in his comfort in the midst of my grief. And then the few verses that I've shared before about the wilderness, the voice of one calling, and this remains our mission, COVID or not, this remains our mission. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord, and all the people will see it together, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the work we're doing. COVID isn't going to prevent us from that work. If we allow COVID, this COVID crisis, to prevent us, then we really haven't committed to this work. And one of the things I want to encourage you to remember is, what are the ways in this season that God is calling you to this excavation project? What are the ways that God is calling you to, to maybe do some things, be part of some things that help to make a highway for people to find God? For me, I think this, the, the podcast that, I, that has come to me is part of that for me. It's part of a ministry for me that's new to me, of working at revealing to, to, to folks the glory of the Lord. But what is it in your life? Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a, an old friend. Um, but what is it that God is calling you to address that his glory will, may be revealed? Because there's nothing like a virus to prevent God's glory to be revealed. It's not going to prevent his glory from being revealed. One of the things that I, I, I'm deeply committed to is the idea that when, when the Holy Spirit comes, and we know this throughout history, we talked about it in the ministry team this week, but when the Holy Spirit has come, the, the modern Pentecostal movement began in the early 1900s in California. And when the Spirit came, the people of God suddenly became very concerned about justice. 
They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they had deep concern for the poor and the marginalized. And that always happens when true revival comes. And so it is no mistake for, from my perspective that we are in the middle of a relook, a resetting around issues of race. Because the Spirit's coming, as, and I have said from the beginning, this COVID crisis is part of the Spirit's coming. In fact, in one of my podcast episodes, two or three, I said, is it possible that the Spirit has come simultaneously with the coronavirus? If the Spirit could come with wind and fire, why can't the Spirit come again with the coronavirus? And I believe the Spirit has come in new ways to us. And with that has also come a new look at justice in this country. And as followers of Jesus, this is not a political deal. This is about how people who are imprinted with God's image have lived and been treated by us for 400 years. That's part of a mountain being moved that we have to be concerned about if we're followers of Jesus. In the context of God's comfort, his compassion, his presence, we are invited to emerge from our grief and keep working, keep excavating this grand excavation project. Sometimes that work is going to mean there are tears running down our faces as we're doing it. Sometimes we're going to do that work with heavy hearts. Sometimes we're, going to do, we're not going to be sure if our efforts are making any difference. But this is our call in this season, not after the coronavirus crisis, right now in this season. What is it and how is it that you are responding to this call in Isaiah 41, 3 to 5, in your own life and family? Because I think, it's gonna, I think it's really easy for us to sit around and say, church means church is going to happen when we get back together again. The mission of God is going to happen when we get back together again. If we wait for church and the mission of God to get back together again, we're going to have missed an incredible opportunity to be part of what God wants to do now. Th this season is no mistake to God. This is not an interruption of God's purposes. This is part of God's purposes. And so if you haven't started asking these questions yet, I want to encourage you to. Because we don't know where this is going. And as I've said, when we do come back, it's going to be different anyway. How are you working at this grand excavation project during this time of disassembly? In your marriage, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in our society? This is our work until the kingdom comes, assembled as the church or not assembled. This has always been the work of the church. When we come back from this time of crisis, what are we going to have to show for it? What will be in your hand when you come back? Just complaint? Just wasted time? Just waiting to get back together again? No, what will you bring back to Christ from what you've offered Him over this time? If we're just waiting to get back home again, we're wasting our time. Because it's not going to feel like it did, or like we imagine it did. And then a voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and, their unfaithfulness, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. One of the things we must acknowledge that we're learning during this time, and I hear it from you time and again, is the reality that our lives are fragile, and that we are more vulnerable than we had any idea. And perhaps that's part of the point of this pandemic, that we are not God. I've said this again and again, that while his word endures forever, and while he endures forever, we are like grass. And the sooner we come to grips with this, the sooner we will get on with proclaiming who God is. The sooner we understand that our life is but a blip, our life is but, but a drop in a bucket. As soon as we understand that, I hope that we, get, we spend less time waiting and wasting and more time being serious about listening to God, being, knowing God, and then following what he says. One of the things that encourages me in this whole thing comes from a course that I taught this semester called Spirituality, Aging, and Regeneration. And I taught it with an occupational therapy professor, Tam Humbert. And one of the things we recognized and realized, which I had known earlier, but had a lot of conversation with students about, is that as people age, they actually become happier. Age, happiness, contentment, life satisfaction is a U-curve. Universally, across cultures, across people, universally we find that as you get into midlife, your levels of happiness and contentment, life satisfaction go down. 
but in your 50s and 60s in particular, it begins to go up. It levels out or goes down when you get to a place where you're clearly your health is gone. And the question, why is that? We also know that folks with terminal illness and chronic illness can also experience this U-curve. What happens is that we come to grips with it. We grieve our losses and then we say, how can I make the best of it? And this is Christians and non-Christians. We all kind of react in the same way. If this is my course in life, if I've got 20 years left perhaps, or 10 years, or five, or one, how do I want to live that life? I think that's the reason the scripture over and over and over again reminds us that we are fragile, that we are but dust, that we are flowers of the field, that we are grass that comes and goes, because it reminds us to, take, to, to make every opportunity to take advantage of the time that we have, to number our days, as Moses says in Psalm 90. And that we, when we, we begin to number our days and to recognize that God still has purpose for us as long as we have to live, it begins to renew our strength. It begins to give us new courage. It gives us new meaning. But as long as we're just waiting and hanging out for the next big thing to happen or for things to go our way, we will become complainers and resenters and bitter and angry. And there's an awful lot of that going on in the, in the broader church these days, if you're on Facebook at all. People who should be working at the kingdom, people who should be taking advantage of this opportunity to excavate, are simply on Facebook complaining about anybody and everybody. Folks, that, that's not what we're called to. The time is too short. Our lives are too short to spend time on Facebook complaining and being bitter and resentful and, grudge, and, and, and expressing our grudges. There's nothing in Scripture that supports that at all. What happens to us when we finally understand that we are but dust? What happens to us when we understand that we've got a short horizon, shorter than we thought we did, Exactly what happens in verse 9. We become people who bring good news to Zion. We start to sing again. As Kate talks about singing. With all of our hearts. We begin to sing again when we recognize that we are not in control, but God is. When our lives are short, but God still loves us and we have eternity with Him. We start to bring good news to Zion. But as long as we are just waiting and hanging out for the next thing, waiting for church to open up, waiting to get back together again, we are wasting our time. You who bring good news to Zion, E-Town Mennonite, be, before we assemble, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem and Elizabethtown, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. His reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. Listen to this language. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. When we come to understand how fragile we are in our lives, how vulnerable we are, how limited we are, how little control we have, suddenly God becomes bigger to us. Suddenly God becomes bigger to us because we need God. But when we think we're in control, we have all the resources, we have our rights, and we're going to keep them, we're going to do whatever we want to do, this is our personal freedom and our right to do it, God is little to us. If you want God to become big to you, remember that you are but dust, that you are fragile, and you gave your rights up to Jesus a long time ago. This whole bickering about should I wear a mask or not wear a mask is just a fundamental return to I've got rights. I'm going to do what I want to do. There's nothing in Scripture that suggests as Christians you have any rights or I have any rights. We gave them up at the cross. We've bought into a culture about our rights. And we've given those, if we're followers of Jesus, we have given our rights up to Jesus. And we're going to do things for other people not based on what is my right, but what is good for our brother and sister. Whether it's a mask or whether it's anything else, that's what the follower of Jesus does because that's what Jesus would do. Suddenly God becomes our comfort. Suddenly God becomes our power. Not the government or any other source. The psalmist says, not horses, not soldiers, but God is my power and my refuge. Suddenly when we begin to realize that when everything is out of control and uncertain, suddenly we feel him holding us close to his heart. But as long as we're bickering on Facebook, we will not feel him close to his heart because that's not where he is. If you want to feel him close to his heart, surrender to him, trust him, and let him hold you. 
Why do we think Jesus said the... I mean, one of the things I've thought about a lot over the last week or so is why do we think Jesus wasn't serious when he said the first will be last and the last first? We read that and go on. But those who think they are most strong and in control and least vulnerable are going to be at the back of the line. Jesus wasn't kidding. Those who are, think they are most strong and most control and least vulnerable are going to end up someday at the back of the line. And those who are in the back, who are most vulnerable among us, who are least lovable, who are least likely to be invited over our house for dinner, those are the ones who in that day are going to rush to the front and be held by God close to his heart. And he's going to lead them to Mount Zion. Yesterday, Jacob and Heidi and Ezra spent much of the afternoon and evening with us. Soon after getting there, Ezra came walking up to me, held out his arms, and walked into them. I I held out my arms, and he walked into them. I picked him up, and I held him close, and immediately he placed his head on my shoulder. And then he put his face up to my face. I woke up this morning with that memory, that little face up to my face, that little head against my chest, against my heart. And I thought of the warmth of that moment, and I thought about God. And how God, more than anything in this moment, wants to hold you close to his heart and to assure you that if we trust him, all will be well. In the midst of this pandemic, are we drawing close? Are you drawing close to the God who so badly, so much wants you to do that? The God who also feels warmth and wakes up in the morning, as it were, with the memory of you being held close by him. The next few verses I'm not going to read, but it's 12 through. I am going to read them. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord, or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Who did the Lord consult to enlighten him, and who taught him the right way? Who was it taught him knowledge, or showed him the path of understanding? Nobody. These are rhetorical questions. Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As an idol, as for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. They look for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is, is missing. If there was ever a chapter, and this is much like the end of, chapter, of the book of Job, that reminds us that we are not in control, but that God is. It's these. This is the God we need. This is who God is. We don't need another. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded from my God. Because this is the good news. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Folks, this is the good news this morning. In the midst of our grief, in the midst of our lament, in the midst midst of our complaint, in the midst of our concerns, in the midst of our anxieties, our hope, our strength is in God. 
Not in the government's response, not in a vaccine, not even ultimately in reassembling as the church. God is our strength. God is our hope. Can you imagine what church would be like at the end of this crisis or whatever it looks like in the months to come? If we would return having gotten to know this God better, if we would return having spent time getting to know God during this time, not know about God, but know God, spending time with God, and I know many of you are doing this and it's so encouraging to Heidi and I, coming to understand that our rest is in Him alone. Can you imagine what we could do together? So this morning I find tremendous comfort in reminding myself of who God is, as He told me to do at the beginning. God is our hope. God is our hope. God is our home. We can always go home to Him again, and again, and again, until that last and final homecoming, when we stumble and shuffle, weak and tired, and fall into his loving hands forever and ever and ever, loved and held close to the heart of the one who created us and whose love is deeper and wider and longer and higher than we have any idea. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are fragile, we are vulnerable, we are weak. There's so much that our limited perspective allows us to see. But this morning we acknowledge God. We acknowledge you, God. We acknowledge that Isaiah sums it up so well, that there is no one like you. It's not even a question. It's a rhetorical question. The answer is, of course not. Of course not. We say to the heavenlies, of course there is not, just as we did earlier in our worship. Of course there is no one besides you, God. Cause us to get to know you. Cause us to understand your love for us, to experience you. That when we do return, we return as a people who are known as a people who know their God and are held close to his heart in Jesus' name. And we pray especially for Sonia this morning, for Ava Lee, for their family, for your peace, for your rest, for your comfort, for your words of wisdom, for your strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.